Thank you, Ram. At least I know now what you are doing what, when you are not here. And I think this is to show you that uh, the big size of Tel Aviv University enable us to see issues from different angles. And I think this is the fascinating things of looking at things such as poverty from all kinds of points, all angles, and let us maybe develop some new things. It also raises the question that we debate on a lot, what is the role of Tel Aviv University in change process, in social change process. And we do know that as professors at the university, as researchers, we need to develop new ideas, new studies, new knowledge, but what is our responsibility to implement all those things in the field? Uh, this is an issue that in School of Social Work, in School of Public Policy, uh, among many of us, we deal and try to find solutions. So, um, to conclude this part, I would like to ask Professor Danny Ben David, no relation to the David family, but a similar name. And uh, Professor Danny Ben David is from the uh, Department of Public Policy. He's also the head of the Shoresh Institute for Social Policy. And you have more complicated name, but I wasn't sure if I mentioned all part of it. And Danny wanted to show us how things look from, why didn't you use Israeli concept? You talk about 30,000 feet above, why not talk about Israeli world? Come here. Danny. And share with us, I just try to get out of here. Let's see, it's good. Hi. Okay, it's, a, it's an honor for me to uh, participate uh, in this uh, um, symposium today and uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the recipients of the Dan David Prize uh, and also the David family. As you can imagine, teaching at Tel Aviv University with this name and a building in that uh, uh, with a very similar name. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do is to take uh, the issues that were discussed until now and in some ways if even connect them to, uh, to the next uh, session here uh, and, and with Professor Heckman's work. Uh, our Professor Eckstein spoke about uh, the primary source of the, the, the problems here in, in the labor market and I will dig a little bit deeper and go uh, to education in that regard. Uh, but I would like to do uh, something a little bit uh, different than before, and maybe uh, show you where we were as a nation, where we are, where we're headed, what that means, and some of the implications in this regard. Uh, because uh, we're, we're a study in irony in many cases, in many instances. Uh, we have some, one of the most innovative private uh, sectors, uh, leading universities and medical sectors, and at the same time, a very large and increasing share of the population is being left behind. Um, and, and in a sense, it's, it's really two nations in one if we take the relative poverty concept uh, from before uh, to, to different areas. And in fact, I'd like to start in what is essentially a very different area, but very much related. When we talk about economic growth, productivity is key. And one way to look at productivity labor productivity, the amount produced per hour. And here you can see a comparison of Israel to all of the OECD countries. And as you can see, you have to wait a long time until you see us on the graph until we appear. $37 an hour compared to 67 in the US. It's going to be very difficult to have high wages when you produce very little per hour. The problem is not only that it's low, when you look at this over time, and one of the things that we try to do at the Shoish Institution is to take the data as far back as possible, to compare to as many countries as possible. When we started 1970, for example, and compare the G7 to Israel, you can see that 
while productivity has grown here, it has grown at a much slower pace over time, very steady but much slower pace than in the G7 countries, so that the gap between them and us has grown over fourfold over the past several decades. And, and that has huge ramifications for the future in terms of our ability uh, to keep our best and brightest here, among other things. Uh, and the question is, how can this be? What's going on here? Uh, I believe that it has a lot to do with this fact that we have two nations in one, that part of it is cutting edge and the other part is not receiving either the tools or conditions to work in a modern economy. That other part of Israel is not only big, its share in the total is growing. And as such, um, we're falling further and further behind. The more conventional way of looking at these uh, differences within a country is income inequality, obviously, which takes the, the concept of the relative poverty uh, a little bit further. The Gini coefficient in Israel, um, and this, the, the, there's a slight difference here between uh, what I'm going to show you and what uh, Professor Akshay showed you earlier. This is based on the Luxembourg income study rather than OECD data which is a little bit more accurate uh, data. And also, we use the same um, measures for determining uh, family size here, so that all of the countries are measured in the same way. Uh, going back to what uh, Professor Bourguignon spoke about, the importance of measurement. And an interesting thing uh, emerges from this. That this is the, the Gini coefficient in uh, net income, disposable incomes in the developed world. And this is Israel. We've actually overtaken the U.S. in recent years. Um, now, the conventional wisdom in Israel is that ha this is primarily due to uh, the two very large and, and growing population groups in Israel, Arab Israelis and, and Haredim, ultra-Orthodox Jews, who are uh, essentially very poor. And, and again, populations are growing. If we look at the extent of poverty among these groups, well, in 1990, 40% of the households, uh, Arab-Israeli households, uh, was under the poverty line. Today, it's over 50%. With, among the ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Haredim, the situation is even worse. And given that these are very large and, and growing population groups, it's, it's only natural to assume that uh, the primary problem in Israel, as far as inequality and also poverty, uh, is uh, due to these two groups. However, when we remove them from the sample and, 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 and re-estimate the Gini coefficient among Israelis who are not Haredim, Jewish Israelis who are not Haredim, you can see that although the increase in recent years has apparently been due to the Arab Israelis and Haredim, if the Jews here who are the majority, the Jews who are not Haredim would be a separate country, we would have one of the highest rates of income inequality in the developed world. In other words, we make life too easy for ourselves by saying it's all located there, all the problems are there, it's much, much broader than that. And, and, and when you drill down, where's this coming from? Uh, clearly, the, you know, the, the labor market is key, but what determines what's happening in the labor market? Well, the jumping off point into the labor market is the education uh, that we give our children. And when we look at core subjects, math, science, and reading, and compare ourselves to uh, 25 relevant developed world countries, what is the gap among our children compared to the gap among other children? In other words, you have the PISA exam, the TIMS exams, and so on. Uh, you have the average grade in each country. What is the standard deviation? What is the gap in these exams? And how does it compare in Israel to the other countries? And you can see that in every single exam that has been given here uh, uh, since the late 90s, uh, the gap among our children in core curriculum subjects is the highest in the developed world. Keep in mind that this is not because of the ultra-Orthodox Jews, whose, many of whose children do not study what they need to be studying and therefore don't take the exam. So this was, had they taken the exam, it would be, be even worse, although you can't be worse in first place, but you can have a higher standard deviation. Taking this a bit further, if we look at middle class income inequality, so there is no formal uh, definition of middle class, but uh, so do the following experiment. If we rank everyone in Israel from the poorest to the wealthiest, throw out the bottom 25% and the top 25% and refer to the rest as middle class, and it's not really sensitive to this specification, what is the gap between someone at the 75th percentile and someone at the 25th percentile? So a two here would mean that it makes twice as much. This is what it looks like 
in the developed world, and this is Israel. Okay, so the issue of inequality is, is much broader uh, and much deeper than we tend to give it credit for, and, and it's not just an issue of, uh, of the Haredim and the Arabs in Israel. So going to the labor market, if we look at prime working age Israelis, and this uh, requires a little bit of an explanation because prime working age is generally 25 to 34, but in Israel, because uh, we go to the army and then we start school later, everything is delayed, then we have excuses why we don't work. But if you look at 35, 54, we run out of excuses. So what does it look like when we compare Israel, uh, uh, Israelis of different education levels to get an idea how this thing developed over time? We start with the least educated Israelis going as far back in time as we can find them in 1970. They worked. This is people with no more than four years of education. Over 90% were employed. Now keep in mind, because of the skill bias technical change that was referred to earlier, and the increase in demand for, for educated and skilled workers, and the relative decrease in demand for uneducated, there are, there's a drop, a big, big drop in the uh, employment levels of uh, the relatively uneducated. And if you split up the entire group here, by years of education, you can see how Israel's developed over the years from a, a country where uh, it didn't really matter if you were educated or not. Uh, you could find a job and there were high employment rates. We've become a much more, uh, much more similar to other developed world countries. And, and you can see um, part of what uh, Professor Eckstein was referring to earlier. In recent years, there has been an increase in employment rates, primarily among the, the, the lower educated and less skilled. A lot of that has to do, however, with the fact that we hit bottom over a decade ago with the Intifada. Uh, uh, we had a major recession here, our worst in decades, and ever since we've been coming out, uh, and, and so the people who have primarily benefited from it are, are the lower skilled. This does not include the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, because the number of years that they study has little to do with what we consider higher education and so on. Uh, where most of the men do not study beyond eighth grade a, a core curriculum, and even that's partial. So where are the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, on this kind of a graph? Uh, well, contrary to public opinion in Israel, conventional wisdom that they never worked in Israel, they may work abroad, but here they don't. They did. Over 80% were employed in the late 70s. But the drop in employment rates among the Haredim has been basically identical to people who are completely uneducated. Uh, and here, too, you can see an increase in recent years. They, their employment has risen, as has uh, low-skilled. But this has huge ramifications for the future, given the size of this group and the rate that it's growing within Israel's population. So when we talk about solutions, uh, it's important to talk about vocational training. It's important to talk about uh, all kinds of basically rear guard actions for adults but we need to reach a lot of these kids when they're kids before they grow up because it's going to be a lost cause afterwards. We're just simply not going to be able to handle that kind of, a, 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 of an issue when so many kids are going to become adults. And you'll get a little bit on the demographics in a moment. Putting the Haredim aside, the importance of education uh, in terms of employment for Arab Israelis versus uh, Jewish Israelis, and this does not have the Haredim among the Jews, men versus women, we start with, uh, again, prime working age, 35, 54. Uneducated Arab women, those who didn't finish high school, in fact, didn't finish beyond 11th years of schooling, very few are employed. Uneducated Jewish women, it's higher, but nothing to write home about, about two thirds. Arab men and, and Jewish men, uneducated, roughly the same, between two thirds and three quarters. Not very high. Now, if you stay with these same groups, and go to the other end of the education spectrum with academic education, what kind of employment rates do we see? Um, well, for Jews, Arab, America, um, I'm sorry, uh, Arab Jews, Arab men and Jewish men, uh, you can see that it's very high. Uh, I should point out what I'm not showing you here is that it matters very much what you study and where you study, and that affects wages and your ability to find what you want in terms of work. And yet, if we do a binary, are employed, not employed, it makes a huge difference uh, just at this very basic level. Jewish women, very high uh, rates of employment among the educated. 
And among Arab Israeli women, it's not at the same levels, but when we tend to say in general that Arab Israeli women don't work, what we're really saying is that the uneducated group is simply huge compared to the rest. Um, now, if we drill a little bit deeper with regard to the Haredim, one of the things that we see in Israel is an opening of, of newer colleges that, and, and more and more Haredim, ultra-Orthodox Jews, who now uh, study in higher education by the thousands. So we have, again, conventional wisdom that we're turning the corner finally on this issue. One of the problems with conventional wisdom is that it's based on partial and anecdotal evidence. So what does it look like when we look at the, the larger uh, share of the pop, or the larger issue? After all, more and more Haredim are studying college, but there are more and more Haredim. So what is the percentage of them that is actually finishing, not just studying in college? And as a benchmark, among secular Jews in Israel, the, the share of uh, those with academic degrees is, is very high compared to the West and rising more for women than for men. Not all of it uh, are, are degrees that are worth very much, and yet it's still something. Um, what does the situation look like for prime working age Haredim? And you can see that it's very low and very stable over the past decade. This is not going anywhere. And, and also no difference between men and women. Now, part of the comeback to what I've just shown you here is that the change that we see is not among 35 to 54 year olds, but actually among the younger uh, Haredim. So let's look at, kind of go outside the parameters of this graph to 20 to 34 year olds. And this is what it looks like for men, for Haredim men who are 20 to 34, it's almost zero and also not going anywhere. For women, it's a little bit better, nothing to write home about. So while we tend to say the Haredim should work, they should go to the army, we should include them, they have to have basic skills. And, and how much they don't have basic skills, you can see basically in this graph, comparing Haredim in America to Haredim in Israel. Okay? And uh, in, in, in the United States, they cannot avoid a core curriculum like they can here. So they have to study what they need to know. The children have rights. And when you see how that ends up in terms of academic degrees, huge difference. This is Haredim versus Haredim in the US versus Israel. It's still low compared to the rest of the United States. However, twice as much as here, which means if we don't reach our children when they're young, we're going to have huge problems when they grow up. Um, now, taking this a little bit further, the education issue, The average level of education in Israel, according to achievements in the most recent uh, uh, PISA uh, exam in math, science, and reading, if you compare Israel to the 25 relevant OECD countries, you can see that our children, their achievements in math, science, and reading are nearly at the bottom of this group, which uh, given the size of Israel and our need to be a competitive global uh, economy, uh, we don't have the economies of scale to produce everything we need. These children are going to be competing with those children, and this is how we're preparing them for the future. Uh, keep in mind, again, the Haredim don't study the material, so they don't take the exam. Had they taken the exam, it would be a lot worse, okay? Jewish kids who are not Haredim are not doing well. But the education that we give our Arab children in terms of their achievement, well, that's below many third world countries, including Jordan, Tunisia, and so on. So basically, you're getting a look at the future unless we get our act together and reach these children tomorrow morning, pretty much. Now, the, uh, another measure that the, the OECD has is problem solving abilities, ranked from one to six. One, just so you have an idea what we're talking about here, level one students tend not to be able to plan ahead or to set sub goals. So these kids are going to be in huge trouble. Just imagine someone going to vote in an election without understanding the implications of what he's being told by the candidate, okay? And I think that we see several examples of that in a number of countries in the world. Um, so this is the share of kids not at the lowest level but not even reaching the lowest level. Okay, and again, this does not include the Haredim. So you're getting basically a glimpse here of what the future is like if we don't get our act together. 
especially given the demographics involved here. This is the, the, the breakup of children in Israel in first grade uh, last year, where these kids have average achievements below third world countries, and the majority of these kids aren't even studying the material. So roughly half the kids in Israel are, are receiving a third world education, and it's not that the rest are getting that good of an education either. Looking ahead, looking ahead, basically, these kids are going to be adults, and there's a question here, what is going to happen uh, when they grow up? To give you a sense of the direction, when we look at uh, tax revenues in Israel today, we have a disproportionately high share of tax revenues coming from indirect taxes, which are considered regressive. So clearly, if we're going to need more tax revenues in the future, the direction to go is direct taxes, primarily income tax. If you look at where already today income taxes are coming from, the revenue is not coming at all from the 50% of the population doesn't even reach the bottom rungs of the income tax ladder. They pay no income tax. Almost 90% of all the income tax revenues comes from the top 20% uh, percent of the population. And this is today, just imagine if the, when the demographics that I just showed you kick in, in terms of uh, what we will need to pay uh, going forward in our income tax revenue. As a result of that, a study that was done by the finance minister, finance ministry of Safgeva, he looked at basically projections of government incomes and expenditures as a share of GDP if we do not include the Arabs and the Haredim and the labor force in a, in a much stronger way than we have in the past. Uh, we already are talking about a, a government deficit that's 3% relative to GDP. But keep in mind, if a growing share of the population isn't going to be included in, in, in the, in the ballgame, then we're going to be looking at an, a steadily increasing uh, share of expenditures relative to GDP, while less people are going to be paying taxes. Okay, and this is, this is just on unsustainable, okay? It's clearly not going to happen at this steady pace for the next 40 years. Something has to give here. Um, so if we look at Israel now and in, in compare it to all of the countries for which you can find data on, on fertility rates and uh, GDP per capita, well, something interesting develops, and you can see the uniqueness of Israel on this graph. 173 countries, divide them into, by income levels, okay? So you have 32 high-income countries. Uh, you can see quite a bit of variance in, in, the, in the GDP per capita. Relatively small rates of fertility. Middle-income countries. Here you are including uh, a number of countries that have larger families. And then the vast majority of countries is very, very poor with large families. So where is Israel? Who do we belong to? We're the only country in the developed world that hasn't figured out yet who we want to belong to. Uh, we're at the bottom end of, of the high-income countries. Uh, the default direction here, given the demographics and given the skills and education that we give a huge number of our children, the default is downwards. Uh, it doesn't have to be, though. We still have some of the best universities in the world. The knowledge that we need is in Israel. It has to reach those children tomorrow, and it has to reach them at the youngest age possible. And we have a whole other session today on the importance of that. But it's fundamental that, 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 that these floodgates open and the knowledge that is in Israel reach those kids. And if it does, this is actually a good graph because we are a young country, and uh, the sky's the limit as far as where we can go. So I will... Uh, Stop here and uh, can continue later. <laughs>